Who would have expected that one of the hardest battles ever fought in the Pacific theater, might become even harder? But this was just a case on Peleliu. After four days of heavy combat, the battle was nowhere near its end. Instead, the Japanese had the Marines right where they wanted, in front of their last stand, the formidable line of fortifications they had been preparing for months, set on Amurbridal Mountain. Amurbridal Mountain, was no mountain in the usual sense of the word. In fact, it was a chaotic series of broken coral ridges, narrow valleys and rugged peaks, some rising to 170 meters high, pocked with caves and crevices, and covered by thick jungle scrub which cloaked the slopes. These funny-shaped ridges, were as steep as a roof of a house, and instead of one, as it appeared under the foliage, there might be three or four parallel ridges with deep ravines in between, with sheer cliffs for sides, with some up to 15 to 30 meters high. The Japanese used this nightmarish terrain, honeycombed with natural and man-made caves, to form an in-depth defensive line, packed with fortifications and ample underground support facilities. There were dozens of bunkers and pillboxes worked into the noses of the ridges, and up the ravines, mutually supported and interconnected, without any blind spots. On this naturally harsh terrain, Colonel Nakagawa, still had plenty of well-trained and armed warriors under his command, all determined to kill as many Americans as they could. Many Japanese troops, withdrew to the mountain after successfully delaying the Marines' advance in fighting around the airfield. All these factors, contributed to the Marines' nicknaming Amurbridal Area, Bloody Nose Ridge. By September 18, the 1st Marines, had carried the heaviest burden of the fighting on Peleliu, suffering 1,236 casualties in just four days of battle. Once Puller's battered regiment, had reached the first hills of Bloody Nose Ridge, they had no clear picture of what was ahead of them, and yet, they kept moving forward, constantly urged by their division's commanding officer General William Rupertus, to maintain the momentum, still convinced that victory was just around the corner. Rupertus, hoped to achieve a breakthrough, against what he believed to be a last line of Japanese defense, expecting their resistance to collapse or disintegrate, as it had happened on Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. On the same day, he relieved the 1st Battalion, ordering the division's reserve, the 2nd Battalion of 7th Marines, to take their place in the center of the regimental zone. By then, the 1st Battalion was down to 473 men, out of 1,147 of their initial strength, of which 200, were from headquarters and other non-combat units. Fruitless head-on frontal attacks on Bloody Nose Ridge, continued in the following days. The Marines had fought hard for every inch of ground, against stubborn and able defenders, hidden in underground caves and fortifications, within an incredible jumble of ridges and cliffs. Every progress they made, opened the advancing Marines to deadly fire from previously hidden positions on flanks, in the rear, and in caves above, or below newly won ground. Nothing better illustrates the grueling combat, and skillful use of mutually supporting Japanese positions throughout Amurbrigal, than the September 19th seizure of, and then withdrawal from Hill 100. That day, Company C of the 1st Battalion, 1st Marines under Captain Everett P. Pope, was attached to the 7th Marines, and like the rest of the 1st Battalion, Company C was also decimated, with only 90 out of its 242 men ready for combat. At about noon, Captain Pope was ordered to seize Hill 100, a steep, seemingly isolated elevation, which dominated the East Road on the battalion's right flank. It didn't take long before Marines came under heavy Japanese machine gun fire, forcing them to pull back. In the late afternoon, supported by two Sherman tanks, the Marines resumed the attack. However, on the rugged terrain, both tanks were quickly immobilized, after slipping down the sides of a small causeway. Despite losing the tank support, Company C pushed on, reaching the summit at dusk, after hours of bloody fighting, and suffering over 60 casualties in the process, only to discover that, instead of having seized the crest of an isolated hill, they had merely gained the nose of a much longer ridge, 
dominated by higher ground, and from there, and a parallel ridge to the west, called Five Brothers, the Japanese defenders were pouring fire from a close range, upon the marines on Hill 100. Throughout the night, the Japanese launched several counter-attacks on the ridge top. In savage hand-to-hand -hand combat, using bayonets, rocks and bare fists, the marines had beaten off every Japanese attempt to overrun them, and in the morning, having only eight unwounded marines under his command, Pope was ordered to withdraw, and he executed this order flawlessly. Pulling back, covered by a smoke screen, the remnants of Company C successfully reached American lines, taking all their wounded with them. For his exceptional leadership in this action, and also as an acknowledgement of the bravery of the men under his command, Captain Everett Pope, was awarded the Medal of Honor. Two days later, on September 21, concerned about the lack of progress and heavy casualties, General Roy Geiger, the 3rd Amphibious Corps commander, inspected Puller's shattered troops, which by that point, had already suffered 1,749 casualties, almost the same losses, as the entire 1st Marine Division suffered during the campaign on Guadalcanal, and to compensate for these losses, Colonel Puller had put every available man in the line, including headquarters personnel and engineers. It didn't take Geiger long, to assess that decimated and exhausted 1st Marines, were no longer, a combat effective unit. Later in the afternoon, he visited the 1st Marine Division's command post, to confer with General Rupertus, and this meeting resulted in a severe disagreement between two generals. Geiger insisted that General Rupertus withdraw the battered 1st Marines from Peleliu, and attach the relatively fresh 321st Regiment of the 81st Infantry Division, now free after their successful mission on Ongawa, to his Marine Division. On the other side, Rupertus was reluctant to this idea, still convinced that the Marines alone, could take Peleliu in a few days, rejecting any notion of help from the Army's division. Despite Rupert's opposition, Geiger took matters into his own hands, ordering the 321st Regiment to reinforce the Marine Division, and at the same time, he ordered the evacuation of Puller's Marines from the island, leaving Rupertus no choice, but to replace what was left of the 1st Marines, with the two remaining battalions of the 7th Marines on the same day, and to prepare plans for further actions. The 321st Regiment, began unloading over Orange Beach at noon on September 23rd, proceeding north up the peninsula, along the road on the western coastal flat, aiming to bypass Bloody Nose Ridge, and complete the encirclement of the Japanese pocket of resistance. The 7th Marines in the meantime, were to maintain pressure against the Japanese from the south and center. With 1st Marines out of the picture, for the seizure of northern Peleliu, Rupert has assigned the 5th Marines, relieving them from their passive security role, given to them after completing their original mission of securing the eastern peninsula, and nearby islands. According to the plan, the 5th Marines, were to pass through the 321st Regiment's lines along the western road, before they moved forward to take northern Peleliu. The seizure of northern Peleliu and adjacent Njizbus Island, became an even greater priority, after the American naval patrol, discovered that the Japanese were reinforcing the island's garrison, by bringing fresh troops from Koro and Babeldeop. Even though the navy intercepted and destroyed some barges, many Japanese waded ashore. And although it was unknown, how many troops infiltrated by boats and reinforced Nakagawa's defenders, it is estimated that an entire Japanese infantry battalion, landed in northern Peleliu during the battle. However, before any action to clean up the island's northern part could begin, the Americans had to secure the entire length of West Road, now exposed to Japanese fire. Because the terrain on the east side of the road, was so rugged that it was impossible to use tanks or any other vehicle, only the infantry could move forward, to seize and hold the cliffs and ridges commanding the road, without any close support. It took two days of heavy hand-to-hand -hand combat, before the men of the 321st Regiment, overrun the Japanese positions controlling the road, opening the way for vehicles, now able to provide support and supply for the further push north. On September 25th, 
the 5th Marines passed through the 321st Regiment's line, over the West Road and immediately began advancing north, through the relatively open and low ground. The 1st Battalion, quickly seized and destroyed the radio station complex, while the 3rd, took the high ground on their right. The following day, the 5th Marines continued to push north, harassed by heavy mortar and artillery fire from G's bus, reaching the southern arm of Amiangle Mountain by evening. The Japanese defenses set here, were formidable as any on Peleliu, with the most comprehensive cave and underground fortification system built on the island, some capable of sheltering more than 1,000 troops. However, most of these defenses, stood alone, without the possibility of mutual support and, fortunately for the Marines, manned by poorly trained troops, mostly Navy construction personnel. The 5th Marines advanced with all three battalions in line, but this time they avoided frontal assaults, instead their commanding officer, Colonel Harold Harris, implemented a tactic which was in line with a phrase, he became known for, be lavish with ordnance and stingy with men's lives. Before sending his infantry into assault, Harris would use all available firepower to reduce Japanese strongpoints one by one, with tanks, flamethrowers, demolition charges, and sometimes even 155mm howitzers, firing from point-blank range. This tactic, will come in handy in the upcoming weeks. On September 27, the 5th Marines had reached the island's northernmost tip. However, it took them weeks to eliminate all resistance, and clear Japanese defenders from a maze of their interconnected underground shelters, that stretched throughout the entire length of Amiangle Ridge. From time to time, the Japanese trapped within the mountain, would blast open a previously closed cave or tunnel mouth and sortie to engage the Marines, which usually resulted, in a short and brutal fight. By the end of the day, the Japanese defenders in the north, were compressed within a small pocket around so-called Radar Hill, which would be eliminated in the next few days. While the fierce battle raged on the western peninsula, in the southern part of the island, engineers worked hard for days and nights, to make the airstrip on Peleliu operational. Within a few days after repairing began, the airfield was in sufficiently good condition, to serve as the base for Marine Corsairs, of the 114th Death Dealers Squadron, under Major Robert Cowboy Stout, ready to carry out their primary task, of supporting Marine ground operations. A few days after they arrived, on September 28, the Marine pilots, for the first time in the Pacific War, provided air support entirely on their own, during the amphibious landing, when the 3rd Battalion of the 5th Marines, carried out a stunning assault on G's bus. The attack began with a barrage from Navy ships and strafing runs of Marine planes, followed by tanks and Amtraks in a simple, straightforward shore-to-shore -shore landing, across a 600-meter-wide shallow reef. The 3rd Battalion, came ashore with no casualties, which enabled them to immediately knock out all the Japanese beach defenses, and turn their attention to the isolated cave positions, in the ridges and blockhouses. By nightfall, the Marines had overrun most of the opposition on the island, and at 3 p.m. on September 29, after a day of mopping up, Nji's bus was declared secure. Once they completed their mission, the 3rd Battalion, moved to the Division Reserve, turning over the island to the second. Considering how hard the fight, in other areas of Peleliu was, the operation on G's bus, was surprisingly quick and relatively cheap. The 3rd Battalion, suffered 15 killed and 33 wounded, and inflicted 470 casualties on the Japanese. While the 5th Marines were cleaning Peleliu's northern end, the rest of the American forces, still struggled to take Bloody Nose Ridge, which proved to be an impregnable fortress. On September 26, the 321st Regiment, completed the encirclement of Amobrigal Mountain, sealing off the Japanese in a small pocket, advancing from the north, and simultaneously clearing out the sporadically defended Camelion Lull Ridge to its north, while the 7th Marines, continued to press from the south and west. The fight for Amobrigal Pocket, began slowly to resemble a medieval siege, with the daily advance measured in meters. 
At the same time, casualties mounted at an alarming rate, making the fight for Bloody Nose Ridge, the scene of one of the most intense and brutal battles, of the Pacific Campaign. The battle's pattern, constantly repeated itself, and despite all these setbacks, General Rupertus, continued to stick to his belief, that his marines would achieve a breakthrough, that would ultimately bring victory very shortly, so he insisted on continuing with a costly, large-scale battalion and regimental assaults on a broad front. On September 29, as the pocket got smaller, the 7th Marines, relieved the 321st Regiment in the north, and to continue to keep a tight ring around the besieged, Japanese, General Rupertus, stripped hundreds of non-infantry men from division support units, and formed them into two composite infantry units, assigning them to maintain the static hold in the sectors, earlier held by 2nd and 3rd Battalion of the 7th Marines. For the next few days, the 7th Marines resumed the assault southward, suffering heavy casualties for making very modest progress. The 3rd Battalion of the 5th Marines, having returned from G's bus, on October 3rd, reinforced the 7th Marines in attacks on Bloody Nose Ridge, but again without making any significant advance. By then, the 7th Marines had been engaged in a heavy fight for Armobrigal Pocket, for two weeks, and sustained 46% casualties, with all three combat battalions reduced to company strength. Out of 3,271 men who landed on D-Day, 1,486 were by then, dead, wounded or missing. Due to heavy losses, General Geiger, suggested to General Rupertus, to relieve the 7th Marines, which he reluctantly did, replacing them with his only remaining regiment, the 5th, still convinced that his marines could take Bloody Nose Ridge, in a few more days. When the 5th Marines began relieving the 7th, on October 5th, their commanding officer, Colonel Harris, decided to implement the same tactics he used, while clearing the island's northern end. He introduced two firm concepts which would remain in place until the end of the fighting on Palelu. First, all attacks would come from the north, through an approach that offered the best opportunity, for systematically reducing the Japanese defensive system, and second, aerial reconnaissance photos, he reviewed during the first week on Palelu, had convinced him that full-scale siege tactics, would be required, to clear mutually supported positions within a murbrigal pocket. And indeed, from then onward, the combat on Palelu, resembled more to construction works, than a 20th century battle. Bulldozers cleared the way for tanks, flamethrowers and howitzers, that would fire on cave entrances and fortifications from point-blank range, destroying Japanese emplacements, one by one. Troublesome sections of certain cliffs, were literally demolished by direct fire, and the rubble was piled into a ramp for tanks, to climb towards better firing positions. Even if marines would take some hill, this time, the mission was not to seize and hold the ground, but to destroy all identifiable targets, and defensive positions before the withdrawal. Marine planes, also intensified the air support. Corsairs dropped hundreds of bombs and napalm canisters in low-level sorties, flying a distance of fewer than 1,000 meters from the airfield to Bloody Nose Ridge and back, in maybe the shortest combat missions ever recorded in the history of war. The Death Dealer's pilots, were over their targets so soon, after takeoff from Palelu airstrip, that they did not bother retracting their undercarriage. The pilots became highly proficient in the air support role, as demonstrated on September 30, when the Corsairs delivered 20 half-ton bombs, in a 100 square meters area. For the next six days, the 5th Marines continued to push from the north, using their siege tactics, slowly reducing the pocket, to an area of 800 meters long, and 500 meters wide. At the same time, Colonel Nakagawa, sent a radio message to headquarters on Koror, reporting that he was down, to fewer than 700 effective troops. In the meantime, the 323rd Regiment arrived from Ulithi, to rejoin the 81st Infantry Division, and that, caused another disagreement between General Geiger and General Rupertus. Now with the 81st Division, back at full operational strength, 
Geiger, began considering an option of replacing the Marine Division, while Rupertus, insisted on clearing the pocket solely by his Marines. Their disputes, were put to rest by the newly arrived Admiral George Fort, who had replaced Admiral Theodore Wilkinson, as the overall commander of Palau's operation. Upon his arrival, Admiral Fort, determined that Peleliu had been secured, considering that almost the entire island, including the already usable airfield, was in American hands, concluding therefore, that the assault phase of Operation Stalemate II, was complete, and that the only activity on the island, remained a mopping up the remnants of the Japanese garrison, leaving Geiger no choice, but to hand over the island to the 81st Division for garrison duty, and evacuate the 1st Marine Division. On October 15, the 321st Regiment took over the 5th Marine's positions, and continued where the Marines had left, reducing the pocket by using the same siege tactic, further improving their technique. The prolonged siege of Amurbridal Pocket, consumed the entire efforts of the 81st Division, as all three infantry regiments took their turn in combat, and as well, they also suffered losses. Among the casualties, was 323rd Regiment Commander, Colonel Raymond Gates, killed by a sniper on November 17, becoming the highest-ranking officer of the 81st Division, killed on Peleliu. For nearly six weeks, the men of the 81st, also known as Wildcat Division, under Major General Paul Mueller, advanced gradually, destroying cave entrances and bunkers, one by one from point-blank range, while their engineers pressed forward and improved the roads and ramps leading into, or toward the heart of the Japanese final position. And from that heart, on November 24, Colonel Nakagawa, sent his final message to headquarters on Koro, confirming that he had burned the colors of the 2nd Infantry Regiment, and also reporting that his last 56 men, had been split into infiltration parties and ordered to attack Americans everywhere. As it turned out later, confirmed by after-battle interrogation, and post-war interviews and records, that same day, Colonel Nakagawa, and Major General Mirai, committed ritual suicide, in their command post. The final two day of the 81st Division advance, was truly and literally, a mopping up operation, carefully conducted to search out any hold up opposition. By midday of November 27, the North moving units, met face to face with the battalion moving south, near, as it was later discovered, the Japanese command post. The battle, that was supposed to last for only five days, in the end dragged on for 73 days, and resulted in a costly victory for the United States, with the overall American losses of both Marine and Army divisions on Peleliu, were 1,573 killed, and 6,531 wounded. Of approximately 11,000 Japanese troops on Peleliu, only 202 prisoners were taken, and of these, only 19 were Japanese, the remainder being mostly Korean laborers. Sporadic fighting continued for months after the island was declared secured, as groups of Japanese stragglers, remained isolated in caves and tunnels, mainly in the north and the mountains. Army units left to garrison the island, were flushing them and sealing the cave entrances, long after the battle ended. The last 33 stragglers, under Lieutenant Tadamichi Yamaguchi, formally surrendered on April 21, 1947. And even though, victory on Peleliu secured all the strategic objectives, set before the start of the operation, such as domination of all of the Palau's island group, security of MacArthur's right flank on his way to Philippines, securing Central Pacific allowing for the easy movement of troops and supplies, towards the Philippines and ultimately Japan, it was also controversial, as some military leaders, questioned the necessity of the operation, given the high cost of lives and resources. This battle, was also the first American encounter, with the new Japanese defensive tactics, and it would be a prelude, to what the Americans would face, on Iwo Jima in Okinawa.